Hello, hello everybody, Stephanie here, aka Wolfpack, and this is going to be something different for everybody. Um, you guys will be watching me do a quick, fast job of doing a diamond painting while I read. Um, I picked this book just because I absolutely love this author. Uh, her name is Carol Higgins Clark. If you heard of Mary Higgins Clark, this is her daughter. She has her own series, and I have every single book, I believe. I mean, it's been a while since I've looked to see if she's had anything new lately. But anyway, uh, so I'm going to read the first book of her series, and it's called Deck. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoy this. All right, so prologue. February, April 23rd in Oxford, England. Athena ran blindly down the dark country lane, her breath coming in short, harsh, harsh gasps. Her school jacket with the St. Polycarp's logo sewn on the pocket with no protection against the sudden, drenching spring rain. The knap snack snapped to her body and impeded it in her flight. It did not occur to her to discard it. As bewildering shocking shock began to wear off, she desperately told herself she was a fool to have come this way. The Oxford police station was so much nearer. Minutes ago, she would have reached safety, reached safety there. The wet, uneven road was becoming more visible. Trees heavily burdened with thick, dripping leaves were no longer silhouettes with but three-dimensional objects that beckoned to her. A car was coming from behind. Athena shrank to the side, instinctively sensing that she must not be seen. Headlights froze on her. The car raced forward, crunched to a stop inches from her feet. The door opened. Her fingers fumbled to release the knapsack as she started to run again. Sobs caught her and caught in her throat. She heard the footsteps gaining on her. No, no. Just turned 21, she was finally free to live on her own. She couldn't die now. Her fresh burst of speed granted her another hundred yards before hands found her throat. Chapter 1 Friday, June 19th, ten years later at sea. Gavin Gray hurried down the hallway, crashing into one handrail and then the other as he struggled to keep his balance. If I weren't on a ship, I think I was drunk, he mumbled. But he didn't care. His adrenaline was pumping so much he felt lightheaded, another reason to bounce off the walls. The ocean liner was sailing on, a magnificent floating city that hit rocky seas tonight. It would be another day and a half before they docked in Southampton, England. Not soon enough, he thought, as he lunged his way to the safety of his cabin. He couldn't wait to see land again, and the weather they experienced during this crossing had nothing to do with it. He had already spent enough time on this mammoth vessel playing the gentle host. Let them find someone else to make an idiot out of himself doing the cha-cha. No more black and blue marks for me, he chuck crackled under his breath. On these long trans transatlantic crossings, there was always an abundance of unescorted females, hoping to help even the odds. The cruise line had hired him as a 62-year-old host a roving companion who would only be too willing to whisk them off onto the dance floor and suffer the brutality of their aimless kicks. Just this morning he had been teaching the polka to an athletic octocorian, really, wearing black bulky shoes. They were like gunboats, hinged on her thick ankles, targeted for his luckless feet. Gavin winced when he had thought of it. Stomping on someone else's foot was supposed to be a form of self-defense, not a recreational activity. Reaching his cabin door, he slipped his, his key into the polished brass keyhole and sighed in grateful relief. He sat down on his bed, he laid back, and stared up at the ceiling as he tried to catch his breath. Funny how these cabins are so much smaller than they appear in the brochures, Gavin thought. Really funny for the poor slobs shelling out thousands to park their behinds on these bunks for a dreamy week at sea. Victims of trick photography. He turned and looked at the digital clock next to his bed. 11.32 p.m. 
Should he go to the casino and get a nightcap? Be seen? Charm any of the single ladies still awake? He certainly could use a brandy to calm his nerves. No, he finally decided. He had better not. Most people are retired to the rooms early tonight. The stormy seas, not Mr. Sandman, being the reason. No, I'll just stay here, he whispered into himself. He had enough excitement for one night. He couldn't believe his luck. Just as he was heading out, out of the Lancelot bar, he ran into old Mrs. Wilkins. Sweet, unassuming Beatrice Wilkins was her splashy jewels and liquored breath. For days she made no secret of the fact that she was very alone in the platical Camelot suite. There was no need for trickery photography when capturing the essence of that little home away from home. It boasted a living room, a sunken bathroom, two baths, and a private terrace which afforded an exclusive view of the sea and sky that one could only enjoy at any hour of the day or night. A perfect setting for romance. Gavin wondered if Mrs. Wilkins had gotten lucky yet. She flirted unbashedly with everyone. Slipping the busboys her room number, wrapped in $100 bills, playing the hosts with champagne if, as if it was water. Even the captain wasn't immune. Tonight at the captain party, she had hobbled over to have her picture taken with him four times. She was bezoned with all of her finest jewelry. An antique diamond and ruby tiara resting precociously on her bony skull. Six rings on her finger, each with a larger stone than the next. Matching diamond and elbowed, emerald wrist and ankle bracelet. The latter wearing wrapped around her bird leg. The captain was charming as ever. He tilted his silver head down toward her matching one and smiled merrily at the camera. He thanked her and moved her along, graciously greeting the next couple of happy cruisers. He even pretended not to notice as she teetered off, grabbed another glass of champagne from a passing waiter, gulped it down, and unsteadily got in line to have her picture taken again. What does the captain do to it? Kevin wondered. That professional smile frozen on his face as he had his picture taken hundreds of times, two consecutive nights out of, of a five-day cruise. Two captain parties to accommodate 1,200 passengers. 1,200 sets of teeth, a majority of them held in place by polygrip, had to hold the cheese position before captain, my captain could escape. He must wake up with a smile, Gavin thought, for all the wrong reasons. After dinner and a few more drinks, Mrs. Wilkins decided her old broad deserved a much-needed respite from the, one of the favorite activities on cruise ships all over the world, drinking to excess. Perfecting the art of intoxication. She was stumbling past Gavin, saw her, and offered to help her back to her suite. She hiccuped her asset and gladly grabbed his arm as to catch on her bracelet snagged his jacket. Oh, I have to get this thing fixed. Otherwise, I'll lodge it. Gavin only smiled at the process prospect. Miss, Mrs. Wilkins' eyes grew heavy as Gavin helped her stagger to her penthouse. I've got some job, he thought wistfully, jackassing people around a ship. But always the gentleman, he helped her with her key and guided her inside. She flopped down on her bed, fell back, and immediately passed out. But not before the bracelet slipped off her wrist. He had stood there staring, not wanting to move, not knowing what to do. Suddenly, visions of financial independence danced in his head. Who wouldn't believe it, it had fallen off at some point during the evening? She had been babbling that cat catch wasn't working. People saw how wasted she was. She could have dropped it anywhere. Could he risk taking it now? What if they started to search for it? The cruise line loved this woman. She always paid a pretty penny for the suite and would often book it on a whim. If anything made her unhappy, they immediately did their best to fix it. No, he'd have to hide it in here in her suite and then, when the excitement of losing it had died down, he'd make his way back in and get it. Somehow. Giddy with excitement, his armpit sweating, his heart pounding, he tried to figure out what to do. Her Highness was sprawled out on the king-size bed. Three steps up to the right was a loft-like living room, complete with pastel couches, a big stream TV, state-of-the-art stereo system, and a bar. A sliding glass door to the balcony lined one wall, and then his eyes caught it. The closest, no, no, sorry, the closet with the life preservers. They had already had their drill, boat drill on this cruise, so 
so there'd be no reason for anyone to go in there again. He tiptoed over to the bed, holding his breath. He leaned over to pick up the dazzling abundance of em emeralds and diamonds. Fenced. Nesting must be worth a million bucks, he thought. A tantalizing thought bubbled through his brain. Maybe I should just help myself to other little goodies. He entertained the thought for a moment, and as he caressed the bracelet, as usual, his Irish Catholic guilt overwhelmed him and prevented him from commending a real no-no in the material category, material sin category. To his mind, stealing one bracelet from someone this rich could only count as vinyl. Mrs. Wilkins stirred and mumbled something about the captain. I better get out of here, Gavin fretted. Some jerk thought might might have seen me steering her back. Better just to take the bracelet than get tempted by other thoughts. After all, once he had a few bucks, he might meet a beautiful young woman with plenty of her own jewelry who would want him. He was smart enough to know that it would have to happen soon enough, and it would only happen if he had a little money to throw around. His looks were fading fast. Some might say they had already taken a hike. His hair was graying more each day, and his muscles were beginning to sag out of control. He had gotten the shock of his life when he had gone to a movie recently and had been offered the senior discount, senior citizen discount, an offer he almost foolishly refused. Shaking that ugly thought from his head, Gavin clutched the beloved trinket in his well-manicured hands and crept over to the closet. He slowly unlatched the door and cringed as a whiny, cracking sound announced his arrival to the orange life preservers, staring down at him from the shelf, mocking him as I say, You'll never get away with this. His nerves screaming, he stood up and as he, on his tiptoes like an aging ballerina and tossed the bracelet behind them due to the distant corner on the high shelf. I shall return, he murmured. Like a cat, he sprang across the room, blew a loving kiss at Beatrice Walkins and slithered out the door. The crew would be turning the ship upside down looking for the bracelet, but when the ship ducked on Sunday, they'd stop looking. They'd be sure someone had found it. Like any, ruddy, any, like any red bloody thief, he had kept it. He tried to sneak up here and get the bracelet in the hours of the layover. But if he couldn't manage that, on the trip back to New York, he'd find a way to visit this suite and retrieve it. Nothing was going to keep, nothing was going to stop him from getting that bracelet back. Chapter 2 Saturday, June 20th, Oxford, England Reagan Riley woke up slowly, blinked eyes that felt glued shut, and looked around trying to figure out where the heck she was. Forcing the fog from her brain, she scanned the dormitory room before registering that the white blonde hair streaking out from the skimpy covers from the narrow bed across from her belonged to her best friend, Kit. With a sigh, Reagan laid back down, turned on her side, and watched the gray light filter through the small window in the corner. She and Kit had arrived the night before to celebrate the 10th reunion, reunion of their junior, junior year program at St. Polly Caps in Oxford. And they were just in time to greet another dreary day in England. I hope it cheers up by this afternoon, Reagan thought, as she pulled the paper-thin blanket around her clammy skin. A lot has changed, but the weather certainly hasn't. It's what Athena hated most about this place. Athena. It was disconcerting to think about her. It's hard to believe that I shared this very room with her, Reagan thought, until she took off to go to London for the weekend at the end of April ten years ago and never came back. And no one had heard from her by the time the term ended in June. Athena hadn't been the easiest person to live with, always complaining and wishing she were back in Greece, getting into a bathroom after 10 a.m., English class on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and staying in the room all day, blowing her nose constantly and never allowing Reagan to open the tiny window for a breath of fresh air. Refusing Reagan's early offers to join the crowd for a beer down at the local pub. So when Athena turned 21 and inherited money from her grandmother, Reagan hadn't been surprised that she never came back from her weekend jaunt. I've learned enough English, she was always telling Reagan, no matter what my parents say. Well, it's for sure she wouldn't w want to come back for this reunion if... if, if, if she even hears about it, Reagan thought. I almost didn't come myself. It was Kit who urged Reagan to make the trip. Look, I know you're free, 
You even written up in last week's issues of Peoples for solving your big case. I think we should go to Europe and celebrate. Take a couple weeks off. It will be fun to see the old gang again. Originally, Reagan had been planning on going to law school, but sometime during her senior year of college, she had finally opted for insti instigative work. After graduation, she had taken a job working for an older detective in Los Angeles, who had taken her under his wing. A couple of years ago, she had finally struck out on her own, but her career choice worried her parents, Luke and Nora Riley. Her father, a funeral director, protested that her good looks couldn't help but attract the wrong kind of people. Her mother, a well-known writer for suspense novels, took full responsibility, adding, It was all those trials I took you to. I never should have done it. Reagan had reason with them. I have a father who owns three funeral homes and a mother who spins yarn about serial killers. And you want me to get a normal job? To their continuing dismay, Reagan loved her work. The last job had been to trace a father who disappeared with his two young children. As she told her parents, witnessing the reunion between the mother and the little boys were worth all the endless hours of following dead ends. She and Kit had begun their vacation in Venice, then met Reagan's parents in, pa Reagan's parents in Paris. Nora was, Nora was just winding up a public lead to her for her latest novel. If anyone asks me again where I get the ideas for my books, I'll kill myself, Nora sighed. Then she asked Reagan penetrating questions about the kidnapping. Nora and Luke were sailing Monday on the Queen Guinevere in New York. Nora might enjoy a few days on the, in the deck chair, but Reagan knew her mother's mind would spin, be spinning out, of new, out a new plot, and it probably wouldn't involve custody battles. Now, as Reagan studied the contents of the room's bit room, bits and pieces of memories slowly began to surface in her mind. Well, they certainly haven't wasted any money on the interior director in the last ten years, she mused. The therabed greenish-gray carpeting, the ancient, nondescript wallpaper, the temporary closets, they gave new meaning to the word the little white scratched sink with a foggy looking mirror hanging above the dormers you had to be careful not to hit your head on when you got up in the morning and finally the two pieces of lumpy foam on wheels that were passed off as beds ah uh, the price you pay to be part of history reagan thought to have studied at oxford although saint Pollard carps carps <laughs> wasn't actually a part of Oxford University. If you said you had studied in Oxford, people were impressed. They should see these rooms, Reagan thought. The covers rusted on the other bed. Reagan looked across the room and laughed. Kit had pulled the blankets over her head and was clawing to, to the top of them. <laughs> the only visible part of her anatomy being her fingernails. <laughs> nice try, but they have to be black, Reagan laughed. Athena's slumbering position had been famous in the dorm. They had teased her that her long black fingernails sticking straight out when she was sleeping made her look as if she was either about to attack someone or was frozen in advanced stage of rigor mortis. The sight of them had taken Reagan by surprise more than once when she returned home after a night of partying. Kit relaxed her hands and opened her eyes. This bed, my back, is broken, she moaned. What, the accommodations are not to your liking? Reagan asked in disbelief as she stretched and got up. If you really want to be depressed, think about the food we used to eat here. Slap a la St. Paula crops. Carps. <laughs> she gathered her soap, moisturizer, shampoo, creme rinse, loofah, and towel in her arms and started for the door. Another thing I don't miss is carrying this stuff in a bucket to the shower. That there was something so industrial about it made me feel like as if I was the clean and my body was the first room of a dirty house. See you. When Reagan returned, wrapped in a terry cloth robe, she alerted Kit that the clothes was clear. Nobody else seems to be around, but if you have a janitor and your drum and your sumsonite, invite him to shower with you. Kit groaned. Oh, it can't be as bad as it was. Worse, Reagan laughed. The drain is so slow that the water backs up fast and your feet get a good slimy soak. We should get up a booth for pedicures and fungus dip outside the bathroom. Reagan dressed quickly, pulling on jeans, sneakers, and a yellow cotton crew neck sweater that had been given to her by a former boyfriend only after his maid had shrunk it in the wash. 
Approaching the fog stone mirror, she plugged in her traveling hairdryer and bent over. Scrunching her dark permed hair, she remembered the hours she had spent at the sink drying her waist-length parted in the middle dresses, and silently prayed that none of her former classmates had brought along old pictures. But it was the same pair of blue eyes that stared back at her when she straightened up and looked in the mirror. The only time they looked different was when she used color contacts in an attempt to avoid being recognized on the job. And she thought, thankfully, her size 8 jeans still fit. She reached for her cosmetic kit. As she opened it, the smell of white linen waved across the room. A purse-sized vial of perfume that spilled all over everything in her pocketbook, including her English money. She laid some still damp bills on the dresser, the now older looking face of Queen Elizabeth staring up at her reproachfully. Sorry, Your Majesty, but it does smell good. The door of the bathroom opened and was slammed shut with a vicious bang. I slipped on the moss in the shower, Kit snapped, and I scraped my butt on the drain pipe. I wonder if Jacoby and Mares has a London office. Jacoby and Mares was the New York, New York law firm whose television commercials urged you to sue your grandmother if you tripped over her hand crochet rug. Crochet rug. Kit's sun-streaked hair was still wet from the shower. Water was squishing from her five and dime thongs. Her traveling robe covered all five three five feet three of her slender frame. A plumbing salesman would starve to death in these parts. Kit continued, and to think, Thomas Crapper was an Englishman. They should pay more homage to his memory. I feel responsible, Reagan said humbly. I should have told you to wear shoes with cleats. Anyway, let's get out of here and go downtown. Thank you all so very much for listening to me, listening to me read these first two chapters of this book. Uh, hopefully you could listen to me. <laughs> I'm not the greatest story reader. I mean, I sound so much better in my head <laughs> when I'm reading than out loud. So hopefully, maybe if I keep doing this, I will get better. But, you know, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to read out loud than it is in your head, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button down below. And if you are new to my channel, hey! and enjoyed yourself, please hit that subscribe button and that bell to be notified at any time. I will have some more uh, either unboxings or a couple, no couple more chapters. I hope you all have a great day. Stay safe. And un until next time, 